In this presentation, I will discuss what DC power is and how it is used in the X-ray department. Worldwide, electrical power comes in two forms. The first is AC power, or as it's more commonly known, alternating current. AC is present in most wall outlets and is electricity that is transmitted by power lines. DC stands for direct current and is the power that is produced by batteries, solar cells, and other DC devices. The characteristic that differentiates DC power from AC power is that DC power only flows in one direction in a circuit, whereas AC power will periodically reverse its direction in a wire, at times flowing from right to left, then flowing from left to right. To function properly, an X-ray tube requires DC power. In the X-ray tube, we only want the electrons flowing from the cathode to the anode, not the other way. Just before the AC power that powers your X-ray machine is sent to the tube, it is converted to DC by a rectifier bridge circuit. By a large degree, the greatest source of DC power is the battery. The battery is not only a source of DC power, but also a storage device for DC power. It should be noted at this time that AC power can be converted to DC using a few electrical components. Your computer is a DC device. One of the functions of its power supply is to change the AC power coming in from your plug to DC needed to operate the computer. The conversion of DC to AC power is simple, but more involved and requires a device called an electrical inverter. Since batteries are a source of DC power, they tend to be used in low voltage situations of 12 volts or less. It is possible to power an X-ray machine using batteries, but to generate the voltages necessary to make X-rays, the DC power in the batteries needs to be converted to AC to achieve a high voltage and back to DC to power the X-ray tube. Generally, there are two battery technologies, dry cell and wet cell batteries. Let's take a look at dry cell technology first. Dry cells are the batteries that power flashlights, calculators, digital watches, and other low power devices. We start with a zinc can. We then insert a carbon rod in such a manner that the rod does not touch the can itself. In the space between the rod and the can, we fill in with an acid paste. Finally, we drop a lid in place that seals the paste in the can. The acid paste chemically reacts with the cell's components, removing electrons from the carbon rod and deposits them on the zinc container, leaving a negative charge in the can and a positive charge in the rod. The can and the rod combination are called one cell. The cell is the basic unit of all battery types. Dry cell batteries have some common characteristics. They generally produce 1.5 volts per cell. They can be small and light like a watch battery or a bit heavier like a D-cell battery. The battery is sealed and the acid paste won't leak out, meaning the battery can be oriented in different positions and the acid won't pour out of the battery. Generally, dry cells can't be recharged. When the battery is dead, it needs to be re recycled. Dry cell batteries don't store enough electrons to supply power for high current applications, like starting a car or powering an X-ray machine. The second type of battery is a wet cell battery. For a wet cell, we begin with an acid-proof container usually made of plastic or a rubber compound. Into the container we place a lead oxide plate. This forms one electrode of the battery. Add to the container a second plate made of lead and this forms the second electrode of the battery. We now fill the battery with a sulfuric acid solution. And finally top the battery off with a lid to contain the acid but the lid doesn't completely seal the battery. The battery must be vented because when the battery is recharged, 
hydrogen gas is produced and the battery would explode from the pressure generated by the gas. This also explains why it's a bad idea to have flames or sparks near a wet cell battery as it recharges. The acid's action on the lead plates causes electrons to migrate from the lead oxide plate to the lead plate, producing an electrical charge to accumulate in the cell. So what are the characteristics of a wet cell battery that makes them useful? The cells in a wet cell battery generate about 2 volts per cell, a bit more than a dry cell battery. Wet cell batteries are generally larger and heavier than dry cell batteries, since they contain significant portions of lead. Wet cell batteries cannot be turned upside down. If they are inverted, the acid will leak out of the battery. Position sensitivity plus size and weight restricts their use to heavy duty applications where the batteries will not be inverted, like power supply to an x-ray machine. A major advantage of a wet cell battery is it can be easily recharged. Another advantage is wet cell batteries can produce a large amount of current amperage in a short period of time, like powering the starter motor of your car or the x-ray machine. Battery cells can be combined to produce higher voltages. For this example, we'll take a single battery cell and combine it with the second cell. Combine the batteries so that the positive terminal of one cell touches the negative terminal of the second cell. When the two batteries are combined in this way, the combination produces 3 volts, the sum of the two cells' voltage. If we add a third cell, more voltage is produced. This three cell combination produces a sum of 4.5 volts. Since this is an x-ray based course, why not x-ray some batteries to see what is inside? This is the image of the internal workings of a D cell battery. There's not much to see internally. The center electrode has the same relative density as the acid paste electrolyte so it's not visualized. Compare a AA battery to the D cell and their images are pretty much the same. The AA is just smaller. All various dry cell batteries produce 1.5 volts per cell despite their physical cycle size. The larger the cell, the longer it will produce electricity. And the larger cells are used in devices that require more current over time whereas the size and the weight is not important. When we radiograph a 9 volt battery, things come interesting. Note that there are six little packages contained within the body of the battery. Each package is a battery cell. Multiply 1.5 by 6 and the answer is 9 volts. In the world of batteries, connecting cells together in this manner is common. Your car works off a 12 volt system. Your car's battery is made of six connected wet cells that add up to 12 volts. There are some other direct current devices that are worth mentioning. First is the thermocouple. Thermocouple consists of two dissimilar metals that are twisted together. When heated, they generate a small electrical voltage. Thermocouples are generally used as heat measuring devices. A photocell takes light and converts it to electricity. Photocells are becoming more efficient and are becoming more popular for residential electrical generation. Fuel cells take a gas like hydrogen, bubble it through an electrolyte solution. The hydrogen is split into protons but with positive charge and electrons with a negative charge. The charged particles are collected on the anode and cathode, and this is electricity. Fuel cells are attractive because they produce water as a waste product and will operate as long as the hydrogen fuel is present to power the cell. Probably the fastest growing type of batteries in modern use are rechargeable batteries. Rechargeable batteries are NiCad, lithium ion, nickel metal hydride. 
They are used in cell phones, computer batteries, and electrical cars. They have finite rechargeability, and the lithium-ion batteries can burn and explode if mishandled. Thank you for your attention. This will end my presentation.